Okay, let's, let's get started though, and, and uh, folks will be joining us. So, hi everyone, uh, my name is Jessica Gonzalez Rojas. I am a candidate for New York State Assembly in the District 34, which includes the neighborhoods of Jackson Heights, East Elmhurst, Corona, and Woodside. Um, and as a candidate, I was really excited about hosting town halls on issues that impact the lives of our communities. And when coronavirus hit, we quickly shifted um, to focus on two things. So instead of door knocking and face-to-face uh, -face engagement, we decided to do um, virtual outreach and um, phone banking, um, really to focus and check in on neighbors and ensure that they're okay and that uh, offering mutual aid support. Uh, we've done everything from delivering uh, food to medicine to supplies um, and connecting our neighbors with the resources that they need. Uh, we also shifted from hosting um, town halls, which would have been in person. We were able to have one in-person town hall on the New York Health Act, um, but we moved to creating uh, these virtual platforms and virtual spaces. And as we've been talking about issues, we've been really elevating the fact that uh, coronavirus has actually hit um, and impacted all the issues that we care about in our community. Um, so um, today we're hosting a really important webinar on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day on environmental justice. And we will talk about the ways in which coronavirus has impacted um, our, our work in this area, what it means um, on our climate and our environment, um, and how we can do the work and take action uh, even during this difficult time and recognize the disproportionate impact that this has on communities of color. Um, so if you, we have a, a whole library now of really wonderful webinars. So if you missed any of them, um, you can check them out at votejgr backslash coronavirus. Um, we have all the webinars listed. We have resources there. Um, so we ask you to check that out. Um, and as I mentioned, we're doing phone banking every day. So if you can please join us for a phone banking shift. Uh, we've already called thousands of people, but there's thousands more to reach. So we ask you to sign up by visiting votejgr.com backslash phone bank. Um, so before I introduce our amazing guest and activist, organizer, reverend, uh, I, I first want to share some logistics. So folks are automatically muted as you begin the conversation. Um, and we ask folks to shut off their video just for streaming purposes. Um, but we do encourage your questions and we really, really encourage the conversation. So there's two ways that you can um, be, you know, ask questions and be involved. I'm gonna sort of pay, play Oprah here. So you can chat in your question and um, I'll get the question and I'll be able to read it out loud. Or if you wanna you know, come on camera and talk and um, share your question, you can uh, click uh, participants and then click raise hand, which is a little button in the right corner. Um, we'll also recording this video and hopefully we'll get it on Facebook Live, um, but we'll be uploading it to Facebook if, uh, if we're not able to stream it live tonight. Um, and it'll be, we'll, able, we'll be able to turn on the Spanish subtitles as well so that our monolingual Spanish speaking neighbors can also access it. Um, and we'll be live tweeting as well. So please follow vote, uh, hashtag JGR webinar um, and please retweet or join the conversation online as well. And we'll be wrapping up at 9 p.m. but we'll be posting the video again for those who couldn't join us. So I'm super excited to introduce our guest. Um, Reverend Lennox uh, Yearwood is the president and founder of the Hip Hop Caucus. As a national leader and pacemaker within the green movement, Reverend Yearwood has been successfully bridging the gap between communities of color and environmental issue advocacy. With a diverse set of celebrity allies, he has raised awareness and action in communities that are often overlooked by traditional environmental campaigns and elected officials. His innovative stance has garnered the, uh, garnered the Hip Hop Caucus support from several environmental leaders, including the Sunrise Movement, the League of Conservation Voters, Earth Justice, and Zero Hour. Um, so on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, I am super excited to have um, Reverend Yearwood here with us to discuss the impacts of the climate crisis, specifically on communities of color. And, and why this is so important is because this district, the 34th Assembly District, is 88% people of color. Uh, we're nearly 60% Latino. We have 27% uh, Asian, which is mostly a South Asian population from uh, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, India. We're a very, very diverse community. Uh, we're about 2% Black. 
um, and mixed race as well. So it's a, it's a really large community uh, of color, very diverse community, and over 60% are, are uh, foreign born. So we have a large immigrant population. So this conversation on not just uh, you know climate, but environmental justice is so important. And we really need to talk uh, about why there's urgency in this moment. Um, so I'm gonna start off by uh, welcoming Reverend Yearwood. And if you could just start by telling us a little bit of your background. We started talking before the video started, but just tell us what got you um, into the sort of environmental justice movement. No, well, thank you for having me and thank everybody for being uh, here with us this evening. Uh, let me just say this, that um, I am the president and founder of the Hip Hop Caucus, but this evening I'm here as this public, public citizen, yes. uh, <laughs> Reverend Yearwood, because I want to be here. That's, that's the best time. So I'm not, I'm not here for any, nobody's holding my arm behind my back. I'm here because I want to be here. Thank um, you. And that's what's so important. Um, I am also, I, I, like many people in your district, um, I am a product of um, folks who came to this country. I'm the first one in my family who was born here uh, in America. My family is from the island of Trinidad and Tobago. Oh, yeah. um, and so I understand what it means to live in a household um, that literally has almost two worlds, to be honest, mm -hmm. two worlds. And my parents came here and they went to school in Louisiana. And that's kind of where my story picks up. Um, where they were there getting their degrees, um, doing their thing. Um, uh, I, being born in Louisiana, um, have always been a, a, a son of the state. Um, and so when Hurricane Katrina hit, this year actually marks the 15th year anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. Man, time really goes fast. And so we were able to respond and, and be there. And honestly, for many people, um, that was the first time when they really saw people of color on the front lines of the climate crisis um, hurting and literally left behind um, in the richest, most powerful country in the world. Um, you have to also understand for me that while I was doing the work um, for a nonprofit, um, I had all, all, also been um, an officer. Um, in the Air Force. And so for me, it just seemed like, man, how, how are we gonna have people um, in the country that literally I'm literally putting my life on the line for, um, falling behind because of the, the climate change at that time, but the climate crisis. And so since then, I know, have been engaged um, in this work. But the one thing that we, what's clear is that even without a Hurricane Katrina, um, Louisiana, for example, um, was still called Cancer Alley. Um, and so many people were still impacted by the pollution. As a matter of fact, this past Monday, mm -hmm. on April 20th, was the 10-year anniversary of the larger environmental disaster we've ever had with the BP oil spill in the Gulf, uh, which, which, which exploded. And it's, it's unfortunate that while we, we're still um, dependent so much on fossil fuels. But that's why these conversations are important to have because we need to have real conversations um, with all of us in our community to figure out how we can transition from fossil fuels to clean energy. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll stop there. I'll let you just come back in and ask any time. I'm sure I'll ask more questions along the way. Yeah, definitely. Um, so tell us overall, what is the impact of the climate crisis on communities of color? Um, and what, what policies can we push forward to address it? As obviously someone who wants to become a, a legislator and a policymaker, this is, this is critical for me. I um, uh, released my policy on uh, environmental justice today, but yeah. I really wanna hear from the activists, right? And I've been talking to climate activists in my community for months. Um, but what are, the, what are the policies you think are most important to address? Um, again, not just the climate problem, but how it's affecting communities of color specifically. Yeah, actually, I got a chance to review your uh, your, your policies uh, today, and they're right in line. So I hope Yay. people get a chance to, to check. No, to check those out. They're very important. So let me actually say this, and this is actually interesting. As we are here in um, 2020, um, even before 
um, the coronavirus hit um, you know, our world, um, 2020 was still the year of truth. Mm. It was still the year when we realized that elections have consequences. There's mm. no doubt about it. Since the coronavirus has hit, it's super clear that elections, who is in position um, mm. and dealing with policy? We, all, we say uh, either you shape policy or policy will definitely shape you. Exactly. And too many times, vulnerable communities are being shaped by bad policy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why it's very important to have people in positions in charge who understand the connection between uh, issues regarding the coronavirus, the connection between issues regarding environmental injustice um, or pollution, um, the, the connection between poverty, and in some cases, they need to figure out how we can fight all three at the same time. In other words, how can we fight poverty, pollution, and a pandemic at the same time? Mm -hmm. So this year, is a, this year is a year that it's really no games. I mean, we have to have people in positions of power shaping policy who, are, who understand how important this moment is. It is literally about life and death. And so we know that 68% of people of color um, live within 30 miles of a coal-fired power plant. And so for mm. those who don't know what a coal-fired power plant is, it's usually uh, the place where they are um, creating energy within that process and burning coal. And in burning that coal, it, it spews our particulate matter, which is just something that you really can't see, but it's so small, but it literally causes lung disease, um, asthma, emphysema, and cancer. Um, and it usually causes many problems, particularly for vulnerable communities. This, as we know now, particularly with the coronavirus, um, becomes a double-edged sword in which that folks who are living close to coal-fired power plants mm -hmm. are more um, accessible to the damages of the coronavirus in regards to respiratory concerns. And so these, these double-edged swords, these double whammies, we say, um, that begins to hit vulnerable communities, um, particularly when you have folks who are polluting. Now, why this is really important is that, unfortunately, we have an administration um, <laughs> right now in, in D.C. who is rolling back um, federal policies. Uh, this is 50th anniversary. Happy, happy 50th anniversary of Earth Day to everybody. Yeah. But this is also the 50th anniversary of the Clean Air Act and 50th anniversary of the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency. And so a lot of those protections regarding the Environmental Protection Agency, um, EPA as we call it, are being rolled back from clean air and clean water. So to your point about people of color in vulnerable communities, there are folks, there are polluters, just to make it plain, there are people who want to make their livelihood. They get to get to their bottom line quickly by polluting and cutting corners. Unfortunately for them, a lot of times they do this at the expense of people who are vulnerable in their communities because mm -hmm. they're living close to these places. And so we have, in our, in our, in our great way, um, created regulations and enforcement policy to say, listen, you cannot pollute, you cannot dump, you cannot you know, put toxins in the air, you can't do these things, it's just not right, people get sick, you can't do that without being held accountable. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have people who are rolling back those measures so that mm -hmm. literally um, it puts all of us in danger. And that's why, to your point, many people of color, many vulnerable communities um, are at risk. Um, even though we have many trees in our boroughs, as we have in New York, sometimes because of these coal-fired power plants, the pollution quality still is sometimes a grade of C or D or even F mm -hmm. because of just the pollution in the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, and, and I know you work across the country or your, your nonprofit <laughs> uh, aside works across the country. And, and how do you see the, the work that's happening in states, right? Because a lot of this crisis must, must be handled by the federal government, but I think states can be the tipping point of creating um, legislative change to really push the federal government to do so. So maybe can you share a, 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 like a world, a, a, a large view of how the advocacy in the states can maybe influence what we want to see in the in the federal government. Maybe who's like at the front lines of that. Yeah, so we have to take, to take one step back and just kind of give folks 
understanding what we're dealing with with the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. um, for many of us, our parents fought for equality yes. in the 20th century, meaning that literally, if you were black, red, brown, yellow, doesn't matter, uh, uh, you were a woman, you were gay, whatever the case may have been, you were in other in some cases, you were, you faced a lot of problems in your community. And thank God we, we, we have moved back. We, we came together black, white, brown, red, male, female, straight, gay, theist, atheist, Americans, so that we could all just be together. That's, that's the amazing part about where we came from fighting. Now we haven't got there. There's still a lot of work to be done as we know equality, but at least a lot of those things from different water fountains and different hotel rooms and back of the bus, we, we, we made some gains. This generation is still, as I said, fighting for equality, but now they're also fighting for existence. So in the 21st mm -hmm. century, the stakes are much higher. Now, it isn't just a factor of literally fighting for if you can sit on the bus or drink from the water fountain, but literally, can you drink the water at all? Mm -hmm. And so there's a time clock. So the inter 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 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, about 12 years ago, about, I'm sorry, about two years ago, created um, a, so that we have 10, 12 years uh, to make it right. Since my hat, we now only have 10 years left. Yeah. It was, each year I'd pick off like a year. It was 12, <laughs> 11, now it's 10, next year it'll be nine. And they said we have literally 10 years now um, before we move to this climate adaptation, meaning that the die is set, meaning that we don't make any of the changes we need to make in regards to the climate crisis, we're gonna be stuck with it. And then for our children, our children's children, they will be in a very tough position. And for many of us who are parents, that is nothing that we can stand mm -hmm. for. And so that leads to your question, and how do we make those changes? So for us, in our system, we can do it on three levels, the federal government, the state level, and on the local level. Mm -hmm. And the state level has a very unique position in our country to create policies um, that can literally have an impact um, regionally. Um, they can have an impact that could also connect to other states. Mm -hmm. And so, and then federal government obviously makes nationwide policy. And hopefully those policies usually uh, intersect and, con and connect. Sometimes they don't, as we see now with the issue of climate change um, in different states, and even with the COVID-19 response, um, which makes it so important, again, to have leaders on all levels who understand what's going on. But to your, to your question now in regards to the state, for us, we, we do do work and we see the differences and how important it is to have people on the state level who, again, are climate champions, clear and put. People who understand they're environmental warriors. They understand that, that climate change is a civil rights issue. Mm -hmm. We have a right to clean air. We have a right to clean water. We have a right to live in a society that's sustainable. That's, that's the way it's supposed to be. And so we need to have policies that, that, that move in that direction. We must transition from fossil fuels uh, uh, to clean energy. Even now, unfortunately, um, uh, with, you, with our current oil and, and, and coal industries, literally, in some cases, only being worth zero dollars um, for, for, in, in some aspects. We, we are seeing that we are propping up a failing industry, industry that hurts our, our, our next generation. And so on the state level, we are putting forth um, strong, that's different. We have different polluters um, for different states. So for instance, in different situations that are different. So for instance, in Michigan, um, with the Flint water crisis, they still, in many cases, don't have clean water. They're still dealing with different kinds of issues. But we have that here in, in, in Harlem and in New York. We, we have that, we have different situations where we have to hold um, particularly those polluters accountable. And let me say that this is why it's tricky. The, the issue of polluters, they have a lot of money and resources. And mm -hmm. that's the thing. And we, this is when it takes a lot of people to think that, well, we'll just get somebody who's smart and put them in office. It doesn't quite work that way. You really got to have somebody who's not only the smart and understand the issues of the environment, but also is courageous. Because unfortunately, polluters and, 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 and the fossil industry want to keep doing what they're doing. You know, it's hurting themselves and us as humans, they want to they maintain that. And so you have to have now politicians on the state and local level and federal level who are courageous, who will stand up and speak truth to power, who say, listen, enough is enough. 
We cannot put our children's future on the line. I love my little 10 year old, my five year old. Yeah, they're bad and they act up, but I still love them. And I want them to have clean air and clean water. And so um, <laughs> we need politicians who are courageous enough to stand up and fight, not only for us, but definitely for the next generation on the state and federal and definitely on local levels. Yeah. Yeah, and I think and, and I think there's a strong values point that needs to be made, and this is something that I've, I've committed to, uh, of not taking any uh, money from the fossil fuel industry, exactly. right? Like no money. I mean, my position is no money from anything corporate, right? I've only taken money from human exactly. beings <laughs> and like progressive PACs, right? So I'll take, you know, money from a women's rights organization or an immigrant rights organization, right? But not, but no corporate funds. Um, so as to not have any... Uh, dependence or relationship with with that industry that is very dangerous no and thank you for that I mean I mean everybody can find fault with everything I'm sure as you know we always know listen this person has this problem I has that problem but listen when somebody's business plan means a death sentence for our community that's exactly. a good reason not to take their money that's exactly. usually like ah, that might be a good reason <laughs> I may not want to take their money when the, their business plan means that people in my community literally um, don't have clean air and clean water. That's you should be check the box. Nah, I'm going to pass on you. So <laughs> kudos, to, kudos to you on that. And I wish, I mean, we're seeing much, many more, um, you know, people around the country who are being brave. Um, it is brave um, to, to do that. And unfortunately, you would, you would think, you would say, why, why is that brave to just stand up and want clean air and clean water? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, again, these folks make a lot of money and they know that their businesses are failing. Listen, when you are, when, you, when oil is literally um, zero dollars this week on the stock exchange um, and you're, yeah. you're, you're the one who wants to get a, a bailout, you, you're, you're literally mm -hmm. pushing out grandma and Uncle Louie to the mm -hmm. side who needs to get their little COVID check to just keep things going. And you're there, you're there in your three-piece suit from, mm -hmm. the, from, from some oil company because you want to get a check. Something is wrong. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I, I commend you for that very much for taking that stance. Yeah, thank you. And, and I agree. It doesn't even sound like a bold stance, but it's it's not it's it's not the norm for many elected officials. So, you know, I think it's important as we see more progressive, more values driven uh, folks who are running for office who come from an organizing background and realize how compromising that those funds could be and stay away from that. So um, I'm, yeah. I'm proud to be part of that movement to reject those monies. Um, oh, you you. Yeah, you mentioned earlier, like COVID, right? You talked a little bit about its impact, but there's an interesting dynamic happening in, you know, across the globe, having people have to stay home, right? Mm -hmm. And across, you know, all the countries are impacted. This is a global problem. We're actually seeing the skies and we're seeing you know, a cleaner environment. T talk to me about how you feel this crisis has impacted the, the climate crisis and, and the environmental justice movement, because obviously COVID is dangerous and so many lives are being lost and so many economies are being dismantled. And yet there's, there's I, I remember seeing a photo um, of a very polluted community where you can actually see a before and after and you see the blue yeah. skies versus the smog. Um, so that was an eye opening and seeing those photos of the, of the globe with, you know, with, with clean air. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that and how um, this crisis has impacted the, the, the world? Yeah, I mean, it's hard, right? Because the climate crisis is a crisis as is the COVID-19 crisis. And so sometimes you don't want to, you don't want one crisis to benefit another crisis. You don't want a situation where, you know, wow, it's, you know, this is, this, you know, we, we, we're all home and we're physically distancing ourselves from one another, but at the same time, now we have clean air. Um, so it's, it's hard. It's a fact in some cases we are seeing that. But I think we're learning things. Uh, I think that's what I would kind of say. Um, the climate crisis is still happening. Um, in two months will be hurricane season. Mm -hmm. um, and shout out to my people who are still dealing from Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico yeah. and folks who are still dealing, even in, in New York, people are still dealing from Superstorm Sandy many years ago. So I think that, you know, the crisis of, the, of, of climate is still there, but the crisis of, of COVID-19 is in our face. And I guess I just want to stop there and just say, um, I just want to make sure that, you know, this, is, this has been hard. I, I, um, 
you know, I, I really am a reverend. I actually went to school, like when you're in hip hop caucus, you get asked all the time, you really reverend? So, <laughs> um, I really, I went to seminary and whole nine yards and, and actually, I actually was, before I got involved with activism, was actually going to go off and, 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 be, and be more teaching in, in that realm. So for me, I actually understand. I have a friend of mine who was, who was running um, a funeral home and mm -hmm. we talked the other day and he told me that literally he's up at 4 a.m. and doesn't get done until, until pat, way past midnight. Mm -hmm. And then literally goes home for three hours, changes, sleeps, and then is out again because they have so many people so many. Um, to bury. It is, it is, it is, it is, and it's, we have to understand that. I think so. I don't want to, you know, layer over, you know, the, the, the impacts of what we're getting from the air and because we're, we're stopping moving around. And I, and I will talk about that. I just want to make sure that people understand that, you know, when you've lost and you're losing literally thousands of people in days um, um, because of this crisis we have with the pandemic, um, that can't be the reason why we have clean air and clean water. With that being the case, um, you know, we are seeing scientifically the, what happens when people begin to reduce reduce their carbon footprint, mm -hmm. and so if nothing else, um, we are we, we do have a, a bit of a blueprint that we should look at more carefully as we begin to um, relax laws and people begin to come back. And once we have, in my in my in my belief, that we have a a, a true uh, vaccine and 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 solution for this, then and only then can people begin to return. I don't want people to be returning back to then be quarantined again in you know, September and October. Um, so I think that we have to we look at the situation very carefully um, and look at our, our, our footprint overall. And, and I think that what we, what we see now with technology, that we can use technology um, more readily um, like like we're doing tonight, and have these kind of conversations. Even for us who are climate environmentalists, mm -hmm. you know, we were we, we were frankly going to conferences and and hopping on, in our cars to go different places. So you know, I think that this is a lesson for all of us to really just re-establish how we um, what, what we can do. And I and I think that because of that, um, again, it does show that if we all work together. Um, that we can do that. Now, let me actually speak to that often. A lot of people in the climate movement, sometimes they're upset because mm -hmm. they um, see how folks responded to COVID-19. They see you should have responded that way with the climate crisis. What's, what's going on? And I just want to say that, you know, I think that we have to understand for those in the climate movement that it's, it's, it's different. It's, it's a different uh, hit, a hit. And so we have to um, connect the dots um, with the human toll. I think the more that we do that moving forward as a movement, the more that we can connect the dots. Um, one of the reasons that I'm doing the work that I'm doing now with environmental movement is because I would go different places and see that it was, you know, mostly, you know, people who are white, to be honest, who are at these mm -hmm. environmental rallies. Um, and you didn't see black and brown and red and, and yellow people. Um, you know, at these at these rallies, even though they were the ones who were first and foremost impacted by the climate crisis. Yeah. And so for me, I just, you know, and I'm not saying that I, I want all of us to, I mean, I don't want to isolate any, anybody. We can't win that way. Yeah. But I definitely felt that we needed to um, expand the, the movement of those who are being impacted. And I think that's what we're seeing now with uh, to connect those dots overall. The more that we can connect the dots to everybody, and how it impacts their life. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can find solutions moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I do think there is a, a lesson to take away from this moment uh, of, uh, like you said earlier, how do we reduce our carbon footprint? Because obviously we want this, we want a vaccine, we want to come back to some sense of normalcy, but what is, what's a new normal, right? And, and what are the ways that we actually maintain um, the health of our environment as we, reopen our economy and, and go back to school and go back to all you know our livelihoods but what are the things we take away from this moment that has reduced so much pollution like maybe it's just being more mindful of travel and how you travel and using public transportation i don't own a car so i'm always on public transportation but you know there's there's lots of traffic here and and there's you know i think we have a lot to think about in terms of ways that 
um, you know, ways that we each can reduce our carbon footprint. Um, yeah, and I think, and I think it's, your point is that, so we need both the individual standpoint, but also we need, this is where it comes back, we do need all three layers. We need the individual yeah. piece, which is critical. We definitely need the, the government aspect of this. So we need the federal, state, and local side to, and to put forth policies. And then we need the corporations. So we need all of us to, to, to really join in as a global, um, a global community to really make sure we make the changes happen. Great. Uh, and I want to re remind folks, if you have start having questions, just go ahead and chat it in. Or again, you could raise your hand. I have tons of questions, but I want to make sure we get in any of yours. Um, Reverend, can you talk about, we, we were talking earlier about um, the work you do and, and who you're organizing with and who's out there in the field. And, it, and it's the young people, right? It's the young people yeah. on the front lines. Uh, a couple months ago, I took my son out of school and there was a bunch of his classmates and a bunch of, you know, parents and children that we participated in this large climate march um i think it was in september yeah. and you know I was and, there in New York. Yes, yeah it was, it was so powerful and to see these children and my, my son made a sign and i said let's make a sign and he I, I, it was so creative i actually don't remember but it was it was like oh wow you just thought of that yourself and it was just the, the children really brought um just fresh ideas and uh, fresh advocacy to the work and really, really bold solutions. So talk to me about the connection between environmental justice and, you know, youth and education. And, you know, why is it that it is the like Gen X, the, the millennials and the Gen Zs of the world that are really leading the charge in this moment? Yeah, no, well, shout out to your son and that fun, I'm sure the fun sign. Uh, yeah, yeah. I wish I could dig it up or find it. You know, maybe I'll find it while we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that was the we had that was actually during um, Climate Week in New York City. Yes. Actually, yeah, we actually we actually did a a thing there called Our Village, in which mm -hmm. we were actually connecting the dots um, between indigenous communities around the globe mm -hmm. and people who were on the front lines. We actually had folks from Brazil. Um, and mm -hmm. Colombia, and from definitely all over, um, from South America and different parts of our who are who are of the world coming to New York. We also had them with Emerald Garner. Em Emerald Garner is the daughter of Eric Garner. Uh, yes, the sister of Erica Garner, who was yeah. there to discuss. Because one thing about her, her story is that while her father, um, you know, was killed, um, and and his last his last words were, I can't breathe. The reality yeah. that where he lived, also um, in Staten Island at that time, received an F for air quality. And not only did he have asthma, um, that but everybody in his family had asthma. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just that him saying, I can't breathe, but even um, his children. And we then we saw that manifested when Erica Garner mm -hmm. died because of an asthma attack that caused a heart yeah. attack. Yeah. So. Um, that leads to the, the point for young people and the climate strike. So one, I think they really have no choice. As you mentioned before, they have a they are dealing with the issue of existence. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, they have to fight for their livelihood. And there are many of them who are doing many things. Uh, we have young people now who are actually suing um, the, the, the government. Um, um, Juliana versus U.S. court case in the, in the Supreme Court, in which young people are literally saying that you are taking away my constitutional life um, for life, liberty, pursuit of happiness yeah. by putting forth laws that don't curb um, our addiction to fossil fuels. And so you're seeing that. Uh, we're definitely saw the climate sh strikes with Greta Thunberg um, out um, from across the pond. And even now with many young people who are striking, um, who are using that as a, I mean, as a powerful voice on uh, Fridays, they actually were part of this Earth Day celebration. They actually moved. They would be normally striking on Friday, um, but many of them did their strikes today in some aspects on Earth Day because Friday is the first day of Ramadan. So we mm. appreciate how they are connecting the dots and being much more intersectional in their thoughts um, in that aspect. And so, so you have this. You have a generation that literally has to fight for existence. That is their call. They have to literally stand up and so i think that you know it's today is the 50th anniversary of earth day we have a movement which people should know obviously the earth is not 50 years old <laughs> i'm sure so nobody thinks that yeah it's more so than the, the modern day environmental movement um is 50 years old in their activism that's what is the earth day 50 
Mm -hmm. The conservation movement, it actually is much older than that. And that actually goes like the group like Sierra Club and mm -hmm. National Wildlife Federation, others. But the modern day environmental movement um, is about 50 years old. So groups, um, most groups from like NRDC and, and LCV and on and on and on were created usually between 1969 and 1972. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the impetus of where the Earth Day starts when Dennis Hayes was with Gaylord Nelson, the senator from Wisconsin, and they all begin to march in New York City on this, on this day, literally this day, and seven million people took to the streets. And so 50 years later, what you kind of saw last September was really the, the reincarnation of that. And we had almost that, that same number of people in the streets again mm -hmm. um, um, for fighting for our planet, which is very powerful. And so I think that for them, they understand that they connect the dots better. So while they understand that um, the issues um, of poverty and pollution are connected, are at the root cause of mm -hmm. the environmental um, and climate justice um, and the climate crisis overall. And so they look at things differently. And I appreciate their stance. Um, they understand racism and sexism mm -hmm. and homophobia and anything else and, and capitalism um, in their stance and looking for legislation from the Green New Deal and other aspects that literally connect the dots and say, listen, um, there, is no, there is no new normal. Uh, we can't continue like that. It's, just, it's not sustainable. And so they're looking for ways. And so they, and they realize that literally most people who are now, who are, who are around now, um, who are saying it'd be fine and it'd be okay, um, just do what you got to do. They won't be around um, when literally where you, the, the, the area you're fighting for in New York right now will be in harm's way. Like literally, will New York even be how it is right now? Mm -hmm. um, or will see the rise literally taken away? And so they understand that. And so they're, they're fighting um, vigorously um, for a better, a better world. And man, I applaud them um, yeah. so much. They truly are um, the Fannie Lou Hamers and the Ella Bakers and the Rosa Parks yes. um, of their generation. And they, and they have to be. Um, they have to stand up. And sometimes what they're doing now, they look to be saying that, you know, when you're a continuous machine, um, as young people, they're, they're, they're about they're 8, 9, 10, 13, 14, they're saying that I have to put my bodies against the gear of the machine to bring it to a halt. And that's what their climate strikes are doing. Mm -hmm. So I applaud them. They're connecting the dots. Um, and also they're global citizens too. So they mm -hmm. understand what's happening in Asia and, and on Africa, uh, on different continents across the, the, the land. And they're connected with their, their peers as well. And so, um, and I think it's very powerful. So I'm mean, actually there's you know, young people are actually the one that gives me hope. I actually think that when I, you know I understand the science very well, and you understand where we are, what needs to be done. Um, this is a very daunting. It's, you know, it's kind of bleak sometimes when we look at our, 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 what we're up against. Mm -hmm. But when you see the power of young people and you see them organizing, and one thing we have seen throughout history is that organized people be organized money every single time yeah. and so you just get excited when you yeah. see young people who are just organizing and mobilizing and energizing themselves to create change yeah and then i found my son's photo he wrote oh, save is. the world from trump oh, <laughs> and he did that yeah. by himself i don't know if you can see it <laughs> yeah. oh man that's fantastic so man, that's you know, great even an eight-year-old understands the impact of a really awful leader yes. who is destroying our environment. So, <laughs> no, and it actually goes into the question that we said earlier about science. We have leaders who don't believe in science. We see it now. That's a connection. Oh yeah, COVID and the climate. We have to have folks who who believe scientists. That's a a, a thought in itself. Exactly. Um, great. We have a question from Ingrid. Um, so Ingrid asks, uh, COVID-19 has revealed what is terribly broken about our society, and we would be remiss if we didn't take this opportunity to uh, commit to changing our relationship to the earth and to work towards building a more sustainable future. Uh, the ways that have been business as usual no longer works. Totally agree, Ingrid. Um, COVID-19 has really revealed how interdependent we are to one another, and many uh, of our problems could be solved if we put the earth over profits and greed. Um, what do you see as a path forward to passing a Green New Deal for New York and for the country? Yeah, that's a great question. I was going to give me a chance to plug an article I did. I did an article back in January. Oh, great. With my dear friend, Bill McKibben in the New York Times. 
um, it was that to solve uh, the climate crisis followed the money. And it was the mm. beginning of what we would now have is what's called Stop the Money Pipeline. And please, I hope people can go to StopTheMoneyPipeline.com, um, StopTheMoneyPipeline.com. Or for younger people like your son, they have their own pledge called Not My uh dirty money dot org <laughs> um, and it. so um and so people can go there to sign a pledge to really talk about what it means to wanting to transition um uh making sure that we, we just believe that if you can stop the flow of money um you can stop the flow of oil and that at that goes so to the to the to the question um i think that that's a great that's a great point again let's go to our policy i think that we have to have a green new deal Mm -hmm. um, and the Green New Deal, as folks know, is, is as much um, a policy as it is a, a, a vision. Um, and so it, ch it changes. So there are different, different, there are different um, types of Green New Deals that are being put forth um, on the New York state level. There's, there are different types of Green New Deals that are being put forth and accepted um, on the federal level. Um, and really shout out to a lot of the leadership in New York, a lot of the leadership um, on the federal level in New York um, have been have been pushing this forward in some in some way um, that we need to have a, a green new deal and the green new deal also connects many things um, it's a layered policy uh, um, bill um, that is going forth it deals with uh, one how do we create green new jobs how do we transition how do we move right now would be great when like when the oil industry is at zero dollars how do we then maybe help them to transition at this time, it's a great time to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but also then how do we have issues of environmental justice at the center yeah. of, this of this legislation? Um, so issues of for polluting and clean air and clean water um, and those kind of things. So the Green New Deal actually is, is phenomenal. Um, there's with housing and it gets to some of the, really the root causes that um, the question brings up that, you know, we have to really, really look at, I mean, unfortunately we're living in a very partisan, you know, uh, we're, we're living in a very time when people are very divided politically. And so when you bring up the issue of how capitalism impacts, people just want to go to their corners. But we have to look at literally, you know, what, what, we're, what we're making money from. Mm -hmm. And when we're making money from things that don't benefit us, like we did with tobacco. We just, yeah. we, 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 so we, we've seen before, this doesn't benefit us. We begin to do things to curb um you know how we that becomes the front and center so it's a great question um i think the key thing from that that yes we need a green new deal um we we, we definitely need to push for legislation or we need the promise of what the green new deal brings so i know there are a lot of different types of that and kind of to what my hat was saying you know one of the key things of the green new deal is how do we transition from uh fossil fuels to clean energy so the, the timeline for this is different for me and many of us in our camp we believe 2030 Mm -hmm. uh, the time that we need to transition um, from fossil fuel to clean energy, we got to end all coal plants. We got to begin to move away from those from those entities. But when people people might say twenty forty and twenty fifty, and that actually on the state level, mm -hmm. also you and Jessica will be <laughs> we'll be fighting along some of those battles yeah. uh, um, pretty soon. But yeah, you know, no, but but we need that as, as well. But great question. Yeah. I think that COVID nineteen has shown us again our priorities and how we live and what needs to be done uh, moving forward. Yeah, uh, the, the law that was passed last year in New York, we, we were trying to move to 100% clean energy by 2040. Uh, yeah. That's a timeline, at least for New York. Um, and, that's, and, that's, and, that's, and, that's, and, and so let me, let me say, I'm, I'm, again, being a, a national um, environmentalist who goes around, I mean, that's, I mean, there will be some who will be you know, blown away. No, that's too long. But I think it's on the right track. I think that that I think that that you know obviously there's room for change in that legislation as we move we move things forward. But at least it, it at least it exists. I think that we have some places um, around the country who don't even have those guidelines, and so I, I definitely want to commend many of the um, localities around the, around the country who are beginning to to move that forward, and also taking the the thing I think in New York and different places. Looking to close the coal the coal plants, I think we have to get rid of we have to get we have to get rid of that. That's just a must. We have to end uh, coal plants um, by twenty thirty. 
Oh, we have a um, we have a question from Anthony. It's something similar, and I know you're no longer in New York City, but I think you you you'll understand what what he's talking about. Um, he asked Reverend Yearwood, "What do you think about the opportunity in New York City to retire the approximately 24 aging peak um, aging peaker plants within the city limits with renewable energy and energy storage alternatives? Um, that could be another way to bring about cleaner air. Several of these peaker plants are in or near communities of color, which is like the Ravenswood, Queensbridge houses, Sunset Park, which have high, high Latino and Asian populations and black populations. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, that's, a, that's more a, a great, I don't know if the question, it's a great statement. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, kudos. Yes, I mean, I think we have to, we have to retire fossil fuel yeah. and these plants um, overall. Um, again, this is, goes back to, this is why these questions are kind of, they, they kind of circle around. You know, this again goes with, it makes sense, it shouldn't be that hard. But again, this is why we need to have folks in positions and who are courageous to have policy to shut down these entities. Um, it makes sense, it's the right thing to do, but then this comes the policy component. And if you don't have politicians who are there for the people, um, unfortunately, these, 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 um, these plants continue to exist and they continue to um, cause many problems mm -hmm. to the, the folks living around them. Yeah. Um, and Christina asks, um, is environmental action and capitalism compatible? Can we make the swift transition necessary within, within a system of capitalism? And you mentioned capitalism as, you know, one of the isms that we're facing, uh, racism, sexism, homophobia, capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, how do, how do, how, can we coexist? Should we coexist? What, what are your thoughts there? I mean, I think we've seen now, I mean, so it, it's, it's a tough one. I mean, so the capitalism that we're talking about here, let me be very clear, is that you have folks who are polluters, mm -hmm. who are causing harm, who are making their way of life. As I mentioned, their business plan is a death sentence for mm -hmm. the rest of us and including themselves. Yeah. That form of capitalism, where your business plan um, causes the harm to my communities and the people around me, is a business plan that we can't have. You need to change your business plan. Mm. So if you have a plan and you want to change it from fossil fuels to clean energy, we're all for that. If you have a business plan that creates something that doesn't uh, pollute our air and our water, we're all for that. Mm -hmm. So we're not against, so people say, are you against capitalism? I think there are ways that they can run parallel. We are against a capitalism when you then cannot stop doing what you're doing mm -hmm. because we are dependent on that energy source and you know that and you continue to prop it up even though it's at our, our, at our, our, at our demise. And that's mm -hmm. where I think capitalism gets out of muck when it becomes this kind of um, bank robberish type of mentality um, mm -hmm. in which you're trying to prop up something that is definitely um, hurting us. And we got to stop that. And I think that's the thing there. Again, if these, if these corporations or a transition um, to doing wind turbines and solar panels, we're all for it. I mean, I, I want to, I still, I, listen, I'm using power right now. I mean, I, I, wanna, I want power. I need power of my house from solar. So, I mean, I, I want that. But we just got to figure out different ways um, to, to make our money. And that's the thing about that. That is, is the old saying we say down south, all money ain't good money. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're, and that's, that's what we're realizing now is that in capitalism, all money ain't good money. And we need mm -hmm. some folks to get rid of that bad money. Exactly. Um, and I want to uh, note that in the chat, we included your op-ed. Um, so folks can click that it before. Is. We just have just a few click. more minutes left. So if you can just save that and open a, a tab with that in. And then also we have the go to, go, uh, stopthemoneypipeline.com as well. So it has a um, fast. Yeah, my team is awesome. <laughs> Um, so we're, we're just about out of time, um, but um, Reverend, do you want to have any final words? What are, what are things that we can do? Um, I mean, like you said, it, it's it's multiple uh, levels of action that needs to be taken. It's not just individuals, but it's the government, right? Systems, it's corporations. Like everyone has a role in this. Um, but for those on um, that are joining us today, what are what are some recommendations or actions that you think we should all take um, to contribute towards uh, environmental justice? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a kind of a, a, a high level approach to that because um, it is Earth Day. Um, I just wanna say that, you know, 
a hundred years from now, um, as we um, are sitting here, it'll be uh, uh, 2120. <laughs> um, mm. um, more than likely, anybody on this Zoom or in this chat, none of us will, will be here. Mm. But what will, what will be here um, will be um, what we actually do in this Zoom chat. What will be here is that we actually leave um, a better society for the next generation. And I think that's what's important. In fact, I think sometimes we really get caught up that we're going to, you know, all the movements before us, from the gay rights movement, the, the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, um, many of those movements understood um, then that they wasn't, you know, this wasn't their only race. They were passing on a baton and that they had to literally do something for the next generation um, could be better. That's our task. That's what we're here for. We're, we, that's what we're here really for, for you. Is make, we, want, we want to put people in position of power who understand that. They're not going to be here forever. None of us are going to be here forever. But what will be here, and the next generation gets a copy of this Zoom chat, and they find this. And they say, wow, what were they talking about back in, in 2020? Mm -hmm. And they see that there were people who were still ready to fight for mm -hmm. clean air and clean water. People were still ready to fight for justice. They will still see that. And, that, and, and hopefully, they have it the same way that we have it. Um, where I'm as a as a as a person of color, I have I have things that I experienced and have because people literally died for them. Everything from the vote, from to, to this literally literally died so that I could you know be in this position. We are in the exact same position. This is our lunch counter moment for the 21st century, and I pray that everybody understand that we are in a critical time. We must fight poverty, pollution, and the pandemic at the same time. And we must put people in positions of power to change and shape those policies. This is not a game. Mm -hmm. It's literally about life or death. Literally about life or death. This is not a game. And so Jessica, I applaud you. I thank you for stepping up to this, to take on the hard task yeah. of leading. But, you know, we pray for you and we just hope that you just continue to, to retain hip hop can't yes. stop, won't stop. Yes. And, and, and keep on pushing on. Yes. Thank you, Reverend. I I, I don't like clap and cheer for you. <laughs> um, really inspiring words. And and what 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 how I approach this issue is that environmental justice, all injustices are intersectional, right? And environmental injustices and environmental justice undergirds all of us. Without clean air, without clean water, without a healthy environment, there is nothing. Um, no. And this is, like you said, a matter of life and death. So thank you. Thank you for your words. Thank you for your work. Um, thank you for your leadership. And, um, and we're ready to fight here in New York. So thank you. Yeah. So much. <laughs> um, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, we'll continue to have these webinars. And then next Sunday at 6 o'clock, we'll be talking about public benefits, the impact of COVID, and how folks need access to cash assistance, money, food, uh, unemployment insurance, all that we're gonna really dive in and, and make sure our community has the resources they need. Um, but again, um, thank you, Reverend. Thank you for your work. And I hope yeah. everyone enjoys the rest of their Earth Day. That's right, take <laughs> care. Every day and every day. <laughs> thank Definitely. you. Take care, bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.